Hello, I'm Jen Person, founder of Defend Digital Me and on World Teachers Day 2021, I'm pleased to release our latest report, a reflection on the best interests of the child principle in the context of the age appropriate design code. So the, case, the code became enforceable by the Office of the Information Commissioner from September the 2nd this year. Will it have the effects that its 15 standards set out to achieve? The ICO must navigate a new course this year that goes beyond the narrow landscape of data protection law. With a new information commissioner and with changes to UK data protection law, both ahead. What might all this mean? for children, not only to have the best interests of the child feature in data protection enforcement, but its position as a primary consideration. Our report, written in collaboration with Dr. Jonathan Collinson, senior lecturer in law at the University of Huddersfield, reflects on findings that began with a separate literature review to examine where the UNCRC principle, the best interest of the child has been applied to date. And I'm delighted to welcome him with us today and four more participants to help us discuss its findings. So full biographies are on our website and on the report launch website, um, but on brief, we have Dr. Emma Nottingdon, a senior lecturer at the University of Winchester and co-director of the Centre for Information Rights. And she is currently researching amongst other things, the child's right to object in a data protection context. We have Jacob Orvik Scott, acting head of regulatory futures at the Information Commissioner's Office, who has been closely engaged with the age appropriate design code work. And I'm delighted to welcome Mark Urban, MBE, Assistant Professor in Computer Science and Education Practice, New College of the Humanities and Northwestern University, having taught ICT for over 10 years and renowned go-to on all things ed tech in education. Um, we'll be talking a little bit later on once we get to the panel discussion with uh, the other participants. And I'm also really pleased to be working again with Anthony Redshaw, our sign language interpreter today. Welcome everyone. So after Jonathan Collinson sets out the highlights from the report work we've done, we'll have a fairly um, uh, Q&A discussion with the panelists. While we kept it more broad in the report, we'll consider this further specifically in the education environment in the discussion. And to our audience today, thank you for joining us. If you have questions, please feel free to add them to the chat, which I will weave into the discussion as we carry on. To summarize, we came to 10 conclusions with suggestions in our report. We also raise questions of what the principle means in practice. I certainly don't have all the answers. I was very grateful to Jonathan and everyone else who has contributed to uh, our work and who will contribute today. We consider the challenges for industry and the ICO as a regulator, and particularly given its relatively new duty to economic growth imposed in law, we consider the potential implications of the code to reduce the role of parents in balancing rights, roles and responsibilities. And we considered its unintended consequences potentially and how this code could be used to further self-interest by companies or collective interests. But the question we started off with at Defend Digital Me well over a year ago now was thinking, might the import of a principle from one area of governance into another, namely child rights into data protection, result in unintended consequences, even going in the other direction from data protection into child rights, if and when precedents are set in the new context. To explain more of what that might mean and the overarching question that we feel needs addressed most urgently, whether the best interests of the child principle will be assessed as a substantive or a procedural obligation. I'm delighted to invite Jonathan Collinson to start us off by addressing this in more detail. Thank you, Jen. Um, uh, I'm Jonathan Donson. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Huddersfield and, and as Jen said, I'm co-author of, of the report being launched today. So thank you to our audience for your interest 
uh, in this word and a thank you to uh, the rest of, of the panel for bringing your experience and critical insights to, to bear on the work that we've conducted. As I'll uh, briefly lay out, our, our report uh, poses far more questions about the best interests of the child than conclusions. Jim Person explained why Defend Digital Me are interested in questions to do with the best interests of the child. And, and Jen contacted me on the back of an article uh, I wrote on how the best interests of the child could operate as a substantive human rights in, in deportation cases. My work up to now has, has predominantly been in the field of, of immigration law, as this was my professional background, but my academic work has been uh, interested particularly in how the best interests of the child operates in theory and practice in the immigration context. So working with Jen on this project started to make uh, a lot of sense, although immigration law and digital privacy appear from the outside to be different academic fields. Both fields share this, this tree called the best interest of the child. Jen and I were didn't at the same rootstock of the same tree. And Jen, Jen's invitation into her field was by way of sharing tools and experience of digging at the same root problem. We started with a, with a literature review on what the academic literature already has to say about the best interests of the child in the context of children's digital rights. This review we've summarized in the report and are working on publishing in full, uh, possibly in conjunction with an academic publisher. So why the best interests of the child? The Information Commissioner's Office age-appropriate design code is exceptional in putting the best interests of the child at the front and centre of its regulatory requirements. The code requires digital products which process personal information to treat the best interests of the child as a primary consideration. The best interests of the child is one of the substantive rights in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child but does not have widespread traction as a specific legal obligation in many areas of UK law or regulation. The code is therefore exceptional in that it gives regulatory weight to this concept. However, and there's always a however, saying that the best interest of the child should be a primary, primary consideration is easy. Giving practical effects to it is the next, much harder step that must now be taken. Given proper practical effect, what we call the, uh, or what we might call the opera operationalization of the best interests of the child, isn't difficult in, uh, just in the digital sphere or for the ICO as an organization. The best interest of the child is difficult to operationalize because it is an inherently an elusive beast. A seminal 1975 article described the best interests of the child as indeterminate and speculative, and argues that our society today lacks any clear cut consensus about the values to be used in determining what is best for a child. And things have not become any clearer in the intervening 45 years and are not likely to do so. What I think is clear from uh, our review of the academic literature is that the best interest of the child encompasses a balance of all the rights that children possess. And the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child provides children human rights which protect them from harm, including harm from physical abuse, from economic and sexual exploitation, and protections of their privacy. In addition, the CRC protects children's rights to participate in the social world, to meet other people, to express themselves, to receive information, to be educated and to play. How to balance children's participation and protection rights is the core challenge of the best interest of the child. And this is true in the real world and in the digital one. The ICO's age appropriate design code requires digital service providers to answer this kind of question and answer them in a way which produces an outcome which substantively treats the best interest of the child as a primary consideration. Of all the things that the, the code asks of digital service providers, making this kind of assessment is by far the hardest. Balancing rights in order to come to a decision about the best interest of the child is always a value judgment. 
and many value judgments made with respect to what is in the best interest of the child attract significant controversy. It's further complicated by other factors inherent to children as beings, and therefore to the legal principle of the best interest of the child as well. Children are infinite in their differences. Not only is the capacity and development of a four-year-old evidently different to that of a 14-year-old, two different four-year-olds and two different 14-year-olds may have vastly different capabilities, capacities, um, despite being the same numerical age. Furthermore, the best interests of the child is not just about the individual child, it is about children as a group. Designing digital products which appear to be in the best interests of children generally might still cause harm to some children, particularly where specific vulnerabilities come into play. But vice versa, designing the same product with the vulnerabilities of an individual child in mind might result in a product which is not in the best interest of others. The CRC does not validate a zero-sum game or permit the needs of the many to out, uh, outweigh the needs of the few. But operationalizing the best interests of the child to suit the needs of individual children and of children collectively is a key problem with no definitive answer. Brilliant, thank you, Jonathan. A key problem with no definitive answer. I think a lot of the tackle, the problems we're tackling in public policy today, not only in the digital sphere, uh, could be summed up by that. So I'm going to um, bring everybody in uh, and uh, remove the spotlight from just ourselves. Um, bear with me a second. And I hope everybody should see the gallery view and see all of our speakers and participants today. So, um, Jacob, um, perhaps we could start with you as, um, as uh, you know, fr from the regulator's perspective. There's a lot there that Jonathan said, and we certainly obviously tackled some quite big questions in the, in the encompassing thinking around the best interests of the child. Before we get down to the sort of classroom level and, and talk to Emma and Mark, um, at high level, you know, how do you think the ICO looks at this as a, as a procedural or a substantive obligation um, on information society services? And perhaps you could start with some definition of, of what that is um, in terms of data protection for, for both those joining us today and those who will be watching online. Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Jen, for the invite and also for the excellent paper and to Jonathan as well. Slightly scary to hear you team me up with. It's a question with no, <laughs> no definitive answers, but um, I think you'll be reassured to, to hear that we've been sort of grappling, I guess, with a lot of similar questions that the paper poses throughout the code transition period and stuff like that. Um, and I think to, to come back to your question, Jen, about whether we as an office see it as sort of substantial, substantive, sorry, or procedural obligation, I think there are sort of several layers to my answer, starting from the underlying data protection law on which the code is based and sort of filtering all the way down to our more sort of softer non-compulsory guidance and that sort of pragmatic considerations of enforcement. Um, I think in general there are sort of several areas where the content of the code itself prescribes procedures or at least sort of sets up procedural principles for how best interest must be interpreted. Um, and I think notably uh, in a lot of places this sort of acknowledges the role of children and parents in defining their own in best interests as well. So just to give you some examples, these include things like um, giving children and parents the ability to seek more or less detail about their privacy information and choices, depending on their own capabilities. Some of the standards cover things like providing clear tools for children and parents to exercise children's data rights, which you know, themselves are a gateway towards enabling the specific rights that they hold under the UNCRC, particularly where they sort of pertain to things like having their views heard and things like that. Um, Elsewhere, other standards, I guess, are kind of like a nod to specific rights. So in a lot of places that that concerns sort of children's rights to privacy. But if you look at the nudge technique standard, for example, that's a kind of nod to children's rights to have sort of freedom from exploitation and stuff. So um, across the code, we think there's sort of inbuilt procedural things that online services need to follow to, to respect some of the rights and to ultimately respect children's best interests. I think the final thing I'd say in terms of the procedural side of things is that the expectations of the data protection impact assessment 
which is in the code, but is obviously derived from data protection law, is also procedural. So um, within that standard, it says that controllers must always explicitly consider the impact of specific rights under the UNCRC for each sort of individual aspect of data processing. So they have to do it in quite a granular way and not just say, collectively, my service provides benefit for a child so we can do X, Y, Z with data and do whatever we want. They need to make a specific balancing test for each individual choice that they have about data processing, which I think is important to, to nod to. Um, they've notably got a document significant evidence around the decisions that they make. And we say that they should, wherever possible, consult with children and parents as part of sort of developing this evidence base. And then finally as well, they'll need to do a balancing test to assess the sort of necessity and proportionality of using children's data in this way as they do in wider DP law. So that's again, a sort of pragmatic procedural balancing test and, and the responsibility is on the online services to do that. And that's you know defined by data protection law rather than the code, because that's the nature of the DPA process. Um, however, I'd say, you know, we're not naive and we recognize that organizations won't always get that right, um, either by design or even if they have the sort of best intentions. And so in the supervision aspect of our work on the code, we will be considering, as you might expect, the substantive outcomes and making our own individual assessment of harms, risks, impact on children's rights, etc., as we always do. And I think, again, I'm, I guess I'm also not naive enough to think that we will get this perfect the first time. We have to build up our own expectations through sort of internal case law. And we realize we need to go on a bit of a journey with this. And um, we will be sort of publishing areas where, for example, we've had to intervene and we've had to enforce on something or we particularly disagree with people's interpretations of the best interest principle and stuff like that. So um, that's a sort of overarching view. I think alongside this, and we might get into this in a sec, Jen, we've developed further guidance, including the best interest framework that supports these online services to identify specific rights that they need to consider and how data processing might impact on those rights. And then we've also published accompanying guidance as well about how they could do this assessment of best interests with a view to it sort of feeding into the DPIA process. Um, and I sort of stress the could because when in DP law again have to give freedom to the controllers themselves to choose how they do the DPIA within the steps that are kind of prescribed in law and stuff like that. So a lot of things in there, um, but I hope that gives a sort of more detailed answer about how we, we currently sort of conceive our, our role in the best interests. Thank you. Yes, um, yes, we've obviously taken taken a look at the framework that came out in the process of whilst we were we were doing our work. Um, a lot there. I mean, I think actually what's two, two of the very interesting things you pull out is the importance for children of subject access requests, so data access rights and the data protection impact assessment, the risk assessment um, that needs to be done before processing children's data. Two things, of course, actually under threat at the moment from the um, DCMS uh, proposed changes in the consultation data and your direction. But uh, perhaps we'll come back to that towards the end. Um, before we bring in Mark, I think on some of what you're talking about, the duties and the obligations on ed tech, uh, on sorry, on, on service providers, on digital service providers. Um, I'm thinking now about sort of the ed tech service providers. Um, clarify for me, Jacob, just, sorry, just again, are there any differences between the obligations of data controllers and data processors? Because obviously when we start to get down to the education sector, there's quite a there's a substantial number of both, but obviously the data processors is a very different relationship from the school that has directly with, with the child or the family or, or even the data controller. Are there any different obligations on them? Yes, yeah, so I think um, the code doesn't explicitly reference controllers and processor and actually neither does the sort of definition of information society services, which defines the scope of the code. I think um, that definition stems from section 123 of the Data Protection Act, and it's not defined by us, so there's not necessarily much wiggle room that we have within that. Um, however, I think in practice, I would say that the code is kind of log logically mostly a controller's code. So some obligations within the code are inherently for controllers, such as the data protection impact assessment. And I think elsewhere, the standards are, by implication, very likely only to apply to controllers. So if you look at, for example, the data sharing standards, the profiling standards, geolocation, detrimental use of data, even age appropriate application and stuff like that. All of these standards refer to decisions made about how to use children's data, which more often than not 
slash nearly all the time are inherently ones made by controllers. Um, processes may have more of a role to play if they provide a kind of digital platform through which the controller interacts with their users. And they might have a role to consider around the sort of standards that relate more to the design and UX of that. So for example, the design of privacy information, which relates to the case transparency standards. But I think even then it's, it's likely that it would ultimately be the controller to which the code applies as the ultimate owner of that given service and the processor would just have an important role potentially in helping them to, to conform with that. I think as always, I have to add the, the probably eye rolling caveat that the price, precise answer kind of depends on the specific context. Um, we do have sort of general controller processor guidance and a helpline that can support organizations to answer these questions for themselves. But I think overall, it's pretty likely that for processes, it's not necessarily a really important thing for them to look at the code. It's, it's mostly for controllers, I'd say. Okay, because that's certainly a big a big challenge, I think, in the in the ed tech sector, where um, most companies would argue they were data processors, and therefore the information society services in the school sector um, would potentially not be in scope for the code. Is is I think the bit of confusion that's not entirely clear um, because the data controller for the most part, the schools certainly today in, in data sharing agreements, rightly or wrongly, because of uh, the extent of the data processing that goes on. And I'm sure Emma will come on to talk to some degree about that later as well. But, um, you know, they, they actually probably should be classed as controllers or joint controllers quite often, but, but are thought of in terms of data processors. So Mark, you've got, um, you know, years of, of hands-on experience, practical experience of, of this. Do you think, um, does data protection, you know, feature in thinking today? What are sort of the, some, some of these col common challenges perhaps in, perhaps in buying ed tech and procurement so that when schools are thinking, I want to have some sort of service in my school that does X, you know, will they, will they think about looking at the code or do you think that's something that's out with their, their scope? So what's interesting, and, and, and thank you very much, Jen, for uh, having me, and uh, thank you for um, such an interesting conversation. So when I first came to education, it's all about the VLE, you know, getting uh, young people to use the VLE as a um, secondary kind of online environment where students would access homework and resources to enhance their learning beyond the classroom. And, you know, the whole education, uh, probably teaching profession was really excited about this change. And then as the years, uh, you know, moved on, we, we started to get into this world of ed tech and these cool trendy tools that would be used in the classroom to help with different subject matters. Now, at the time, I was always um, questioning, is the tools that are being introduced into a classroom, is it all about um, impact or is it about, you know, it's it's freemium, is it free for schools to use, so schools want to invest in it, or is there something around um, some sort of uh, area that we're not looking at, which you brought to the surface there around data, in terms of, you know, when these ed techs are starting up, are they promising their investors that they're going to make a real change in education? that they have a moral purpose or is this ed tech all about you know we need to get a million people on our platform then we can you know generate and become a big company so there there was a conflict within the two that i i was seeing starting to occur in this ed tech is it profit driven is it impact driven for our young people now getting to your point around uh, data and our schools um looking at data not not, not at all because I think what the ed tech companies tend to do, they sell us the utopia, they sell us the dream. And then as we get enticed with that dream of what, of the products that they want to bring into our schools, we don't ask those questions. So I know EdTech UK was trying to think about some sort of MOT. So before we even decide to uh, bring that tech into school, we do the MOT test and that schools were encouraged to do this MOT test in the sense that is this company even registered? <laughs> you know, even basically like that, I registered company or they're just a startup, someone in their bedroom, putting this tech together and having all this data. So there's, there's quite a few questions that we need to be asking. And I think 
where schools are now in uh, academy trust and everyone's got their own way of doing stuff, it's very hard to centralise that accountability. But what I'm seeing uh, quite significantly within the ed tech is that teachers' input and people that know about these conversations is done in the afterthought. So we're now brought in in the aftermath of this, uh, when the data either gets lost or it's misused for advertising or other kind of uh, situations. I will stop there for now, but that's where I'm seeing in terms of the current landscape of ed tech. Yeah, thank you. No, that, that is a real challenge when uh, these processes depend on upfront risk assessment and upfront evaluation. So if there's no quality and safety controls or standards in um, the UK education sector, for example, anyone can buy anything or, as you say, bring in freemium products into schools, then uh, those companies or owners can be walking out with millions of pupils data because I think one of the interesting things about risk assessment you were talking about as well is that one school can do it for one set of pupils or they might if they're sharing resources do it across their multi-academy trust of several schools but nobody is doing it across thousands of schools and in fact uh, you know Facebook going down recently sort of shows you the dependency on one big company product and I, I think nobody's really assessing that for the national impact on education of, of what the risks could be of being you know dependent on these multiple uh, big tech providers or as you said that the, the one lone uh, person setting up in their garage as many of the big companies have gone on to be actually from you know they're developed and bought out by private equity so really interesting thoughts there on quality safety accountability is hard to centralize i think that's something we'll come back to emma um your work on uh, the uh, right to object you've um you've um been doing recently and i know you've got some new new work in progress which i'd love to hear about um do you is this something you know how much have you found, come across this already and as mark saying if if data protection is an afterthought and we haven't got these processes in place up front are children's rights whether it's the best interest of the child or their right to object even being brought into this process at all from what we found in our research, it's really, really tricky to actually realise children's rights, uh, particularly within the schooling context, even though we theoretically have particular rights for children and that is being recognised more so. And we also have quite a good framework in the GDPR. In reality, there's practical issues uh, with actually um, addressing these rights and representing uh, children or giving them the opportunity to be able to exercise their rights. Uh, so in our research, we focused primarily on the right to object, Article 21 of the GDPR. Um, and theoretically, a child should be able to use the right to object within the education context. So if a school is using a particular digital learning platform which also collects uh, data, say for marketing purposes, or the data is a risk of being sold on to um, third parties. Um, that can be done without the child's consent uh, because it's done for their schooling. So children have a right to be educated. It's also um, the law that they have to go to school. Um, they have to be educated and the way that we can get benefits from technology um, is therefore seeing more technology become integrated in, into the classroom and that can be a good thing. But child rights are limited um, in terms of being able to actually opt out of that process and say, well, actually, no, I don't want that. Uh, I think for, firstly, I'm not sure that children are actually aware they can say no or parents. I think there's a lack of awareness around it. Also amongst schools and teachers themselves, um, because there's not a huge amount of investment for schools in data protection. Um, and as a society as a whole, I don't think I think we are sort of resigned to the fact that we do have quite intrusive um, digital technologies that we use every day. And that encroached in the schooling context even more so uh, during the national lockdowns as a result of COVID-19, because it was such a fast transition to go online. 
um, that there wasn't really the time to actually consider the ethical implications of data protection. And one of the issues that we found in our research is that even if a child did exercise their right to object, um, if a particular digital learning platform uh, was one that they didn't feel comfortable with, or if a parent exercised the right to object on a child's behalf, um, the school will then have to undertake a balancing um, process where they weigh up the child's right to object versus the fact that they need to be educated. And that balancing act will always probably fall in favour um, of going ahead and using that digital platform regardless of the child's discomfort with it or a parent's discomfort with it um, because it, the GDPR also gives us public task and legitimate interests as reasons uh, why <clears throat> and the right to object not be, might not be able to go ahead. Um, so that creates a particular tension. So whilst we have these rights there, um, it's very, very difficult for them to have any, uh, any meaningful change um, in the context of schooling. Yeah, thank you. It's um, very much what we, we found at our own research and also uh, I think was quite strongly reflected in the Five Rights Foundation Digital Futures report um, that came out um, authored by um, Emma Day uh, and uh, supported by, by others in the Five Rights Foundation. Um, and I think one of the things they drew out was the challenge around legitimate interests being used to basically sort of permit anything that perhaps in the school's lay understanding of legitimate was sort of fair game and that children are really disempowered in, in schools. Um, Mark, I was wondering, you know, can you give us some examples that you talked about the virtual learning environment? Um, what other kind of ed tech or, or tools in schools are we talking about? Because I, I sometimes think um, we've, you know, in our work, we the complaints we get are from, as Emma said, you know, parents that don't perhaps want a product to use their child's data for, say, machine learning and, and an artificial intelligence or or um, they're unsure about how it's being used to predict mental health risks, for example. And I think a lot of viewers might not be that familiar with, you know, what are the kinds of um, technologies being used for in schools? Is it mainly administrative? Is it mainly for learning? Um, you know, and where does that look? Yeah, thank you. So um, I think there's three categories here in terms of when we look at ed tech. I think the first one is around um a vle so virtual learning environment that means that um the school will upload resources and content so students can access that 24 7. say for example there was a snow day or a child was ill they can still access work at home and with this pandemic it's been accelerated in the sense of how we use these vle systems now again um vle's have changed over time so the the when I when I was when I first came to school, VLE was a very standalone system. It wasn't connected to the web as such, in the sense that with the VLEs now, you can share stuff with other people and you can do quite a, a few things online where your data might be uh, or, or your details might be shared with others. Now, there is the other element of ed tech where it's the gimmicks, it's the it's the tools that we use in lessons to like a, a like a countdown timer or you might use another ed tech tool to assess in terms of students doing a quizzes and so forth now the dangerous thing now we're getting into more of the ed tech which is looking at the mental health that's looking at different characteristics of of, of the student and that's what i'm really really worried about because just like in anything that's when the biases start to creep in and you know that's when we can make some ill-formed decisions if the developers and designers have biases especially if it's gender ethnicity and so forth so this is the stuff that's probably keeping me up at night in a sense that when these ed techs claim to be a global brand and then when you go into their website and look at their team and it's all full of males or you know it represents one demographic you've got to ask yourself is this a global brand ed tech that has made a tool that represents society and then on top of that we've got this layer of the child's rights 
and we've got the data protection to also be thinking about too. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so there's lots of I had a sort of shifting environment in tools and data collection coming into schools. I think what you've both raised there, Emma and Mark, is the number of actors in schools now is very, very different from when information about a child was collected and kept in the school for only the school's purposes. And now we've got lots of actors involved and the data collection is 24 seven, as you said, Mark, you know, outside of the school premises. And Emma, as you raised, even more acutely highlighted by um, working for at school at home uh, in the pandemic. And in fact, those questions carry on for homework and for monitoring at, at home uh, in, you know, even when the children have gone back to the classroom now. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is, so there's there's inability to understand rights. Um, that's something that the UNCRC does talk about in Article 42, having you know, information made available that rights exist. Um, and Mark talked about the lack of standards and quality and safety. Now, these aren't things that the code addressed, Jacob, because it's not a technical code, but are there, you know, is there progress in, or thought or work in progress on developing technical standards or tools to help, you know, the practical realization of rights by children or, and or, you know, data quality and standards in this uh, design code or to support the design code? Yeah, I guess um, it slightly depends on your interpret interpretation of technical standards. I think in the sort of specific classical sense in terms of formal standards that you know done by BSI or, or others um, we don't currently have any underway that are specifically derived from the code um, however in terms of broad technical guidance we've, we've done quite a few things and there's also aspects of the code itself that offer that kind of support so um, firstly uh, we've got the code standards themselves. So some of those talk about um, some of the principles around transparency, as I've already talked about, which give broad design principles and technical principles for making privacy information and privacy choices that are accessible and appropriate for children across sort of range of capabilities and stuff. Um, from those design sort of broad principles, during the transition period, we've developed guidance, including for example, our design guidance, and that encompasses a range of sort of design artifacts. It talks about um, some workshops and we give re resources for running workshops for online services to use in their own environments to design for different children with different needs and things like that. And then beyond that, we've got, um, as we sort of already touched upon, guidance on the best interest of the child that talks about the different rights and how data impacts on that and stuff like that. So we've got a broad suite of guidance that does help to articulate and give people resources for how to kind of deploy these kind of things in practice but um in terms of technical standards the furthest we go is approving certifications so we did recently approve in august um a scheme which um supported organizations to conform with the code um and then there's a separate related scheme as well that supported organizations to conform with uk gdpr so again organizations can look to that certification scheme for, for sort of specific guidance on how to implement um, some of the code standards and, and data protection law. And are those are those public on the website? Can anyone access them, or are they you know paid for standards like you know the IEEE's restricted standards might be or other things? Yeah, so the certification that we approved was one led by the Age Check Certification Scheme. Um, I have to confess I don't know the exact sort of commercial configuration of their specific schemes, um, but in general sense we do approve either free for use certification schemes or sort of commercial certification schemes. The ACCS one was the sort of first one we've approved, but it's not necessarily going to be the last. And we hope that there'll be other sort of organisations that um, submit similar schemes to us as well, so that online services have a sort of, and wider organisations have an, a diversity of schemes available to them that might be better or, or, or worse suited to their particular context. Jen, Jen, can I just say something on top of that? There is a trend that I have seen when it comes to ed tech. So um, when uh, Michael Gove changed the curriculum in 2014 from ICT to computer science, that's when we saw an explosion of ed tech coming in to ICT as digital skills. Guys, there's digital skills. 
And then when the teacher workload thing erupted, then we saw another explosion of ed tech coming in and no one wasn't verifying it. And then with the pandemic, it's the same thing. So every time there's like this crisis or there's a change in education, there is this explosion of ed tech coming in and it's not being vetted. You know, the pre-work is not being done to vet these tools and everyone's for it. It's like, yeah, bring it in. We need it now. But listening to this conversation and reading the report shows you why this quick yes, yes, yes all the time is not going to benefit us in the long run. It's just going to make it um, even, we're going to be even more entrenched with uh, data crises uh, going forward. Yeah, I think, Mark, that's an important point, uh, that this sort of tech solutionism that comes in in the moment of crisis. Can, you've got a problem, we'll, we'll offer something, and it doesn't necessarily offer the right solution. And I think it's it's actually part of the, the challenge around regulation as well. You know, it's, it's it, some of the questions that we raise in the code are around, you know, the issues around age verification and age assurance, which actually can cause more problems for children um, than perhaps, you know, existed before or those that they're trying to solve. Um, the, the question around, uh, you asked around sort of the direction of travel. I think it's an important one. Um, Jonathan, in your um, literature review, you kind of found, you know, some really interesting themes around, you know, uh, balancing rights between parents and children. Um, you found there was some older literature, I think, that was, you know, quite entrenched, but the, the the very newest, the, the sort of actually talking about the best interest of the child in digital environment was quite new. D do you sense a direction of travel in sort of understanding this sector from an academic's perspective? Um, yeah, yes and no. So most of the literature that we um, found and, and surveyed was had been created since about 2016. So I think that there's there's been a... Uh, uh, an explosion of interest um, uh, in, in terms of digital rights um, and, and looking at the, the, the best interests and uh, the, then additional work that, that's kind of come out because of the age appropriate design code and that's that's also spurring a lot of uh, a lot of interest in, in, in particular. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's amazing how many of the themes are uh, connected to. I mean, I mentioned the forty-five year old. 1975 article by uh, uh, Robert Mnookin uh, and you could write the same conclusions and 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 have them uh, have them there and so in some ways the report does write exactly the same conclusions uh, it, it is best interest in the child is in, indeterminate and speculative for the reasons that that, that that were identified back then is that these are uh, politically controversial often that, that a balance of rights um, can never be a um, uh, a final, uh, finally and and ultimately defined by uh, for all time, because our, our views change, our views of childhood change, our view uh, technology changes as, as as this conversation is about, and um, uh, so so we're constantly reevaluating what those those means. What I think I get the point that we try to make in this this report you and i jen is is that we need to go beyond saying that there is a best interest of the child these we should balance rights uh, and this is really important we've said that we've said that for 45 years that that that's there in the literature and is, is so well established that it's, that it's beyond trite at this stage. It is about how now then we operationalize that in particular context. Uh, and and, and the, the age appropriate design code is part of that and is, is a really important and, 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 and valuable thing. And hopefully actually the work that uh, uh, happens and, and the experiences of the ICO can then influence other areas. So I can hopefully go back into the immigration field and say, actually, this was something that was really, really important. But um, uh, the, the, the literature itself I, it doesn't provide those kind of answers. So uh, unfortunately, we can't. We, we can help the ICO uh, uh, because we hopefully have those conversations now that it, it's kicked that that process uh, off, but there's certainly nothing uh, off the shelf that we can provide in terms of, uh, of how it's going to produce those, um, those balanced outcomes.
And Emma, did, have you noticed over time any shift or change in, you know, how um, people can understand their rights in 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 a school at all, or is it, you know, something that's there's just no action on? Is there is it going to stay the same if we don't do anything? I think there's definitely a risk that we'll stay the same if we don't do anything. I think um, culturally within schools, um, there's not enough going on to educate students and teachers about uh, data protection. And I think there's a lack of understanding um, about the GDPR framework um, or any of the um, dangers with um, any digital learning platforms that are being used. So I think it's really imperative that uh, change happens so that we can address these um, norms that we've ended up with. Um, and start to challenge them. And as Mark says, try and address it at a much earlier stage um, because our framework with, for example, the right to object and the balancing act around the rights that I talked about, um, that's quite a late stage um, that we start to invoke those rights and then that's not doing its job. So most effective would be to address this at a much earlier stage, even in, thinking about the types of technology uh, and what they're doing before we allow them into the schooling environment. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I, I you know, you hate to speak from your own experience, but uh, I mean, even, even with my insights, I cannot get my own children's school to conduct a balancing test if we object to a particular app. <laughs> you know, they just, they don't, don't see it as relevant for them at all. Um, it's a, it's a really hard battle, but the, the, I think what you raised there is really important that the emerging technologies and the changing environment that, that this is going to. So if it's not working well now, how are we going to make it work when um, we're increasingly seeing live facial recognition coming into schools? We're seeing, um, as I said, those sort of mental health prediction apps and platforms. Um, there's 24, you know, seven monitoring by AI for uh, the prevent program, you know, potential um, identifying and profiling children at risk of radicalization and extremism and all these these things have come in over sort of the last 10 years quite slowly and we seem to have normalized without having put any of the safeguards and checks and balances in place and uh, Mark as you're saying if if teachers um, you know aren't able to put those processes in and at the right point in time and Emma, I think you've identified, you know, the teachers haven't got the training and the knowledge, then we're obviously missing some, something fundamental in teacher training and the accountability process for this to work. Um, and, you know, that children can exercise their rights if they're not able to be part of that process. So the best interest of the child is, is a really hard um, overarching principle, but we're so far from that perhaps at the moment that it's it's difficult to see how we could we could operationalize it in schools i think without a fundamental overhaul and of course you know you get look at the nhs and they've got um uh, a digital nhs digital does a uh, quality check before anything is allowed to be prescribed through the nhs so um you know they've got some checks and balances there that doesn't exist in education um you know what what are there any good examples of good practice you know have we got Anything you've come across, you know, Emma or Mark, you know, in in the classroom, or, you know, from your research or, or just every day that you'd say, this is something we could strive to. This is something that does work well. I and mean, I can, well, you think, you know, I can think of one school in our research that we came across that at least publishes a list of every data processor that they used. I mean, there were over 130, um, but at least a parent could look on that school's list and say, I can get some sort of idea where my child's data might go from leaving the school. Um, some sort of register existed. Is, have you come across any good practice examples, Mark? Do you want to? Yeah, so I think the good examples is um, around climate change. You know, I think whoever blows their trumpet the loudest gets heard <laughs> in education sometimes. <laughs> And I think we've got an opportunity to blow our trumpet now. Mm -hmm. I think we've got enough data and research into this matter in terms of our footprint. There was this conversation um, happening 
probably about five years ago about your footprint on social media that might ruin your job chances. So a lot of our young people are very conscious about how they are seen on social media and how they put their data on there. But I think that there's this opening happening now where we've got some good examples, even from the FGM to climate change to prevent. Now it's the opportunity for us now to bring this data uh, to the forefront and show people and show schools what, hap- what, what it looks like when you get it right in terms of safeguarding our young people and families and look what happens when you get it wrong. And I think that what we don't do enough, <laughs> in, especially in education, is empower teach because I think we come with a lot of fear. And I think that how do we hold um, school leaders' hands through that process? I, I know tech companies are not going to be happy with us because obviously they've promised their investors but the world in the sense of, you know, we can use this data for X, Y, and Z. But we need to start holding these school leaders' hands in that process of understanding and also whether we need to start challenging saying this is another form of safeguarding you know i think you know in 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 schools we've got so much protocols for safeguarding but this data thing is a big safeguarding issue too so why aren't we banging the drum and making it as comparison of that so i haven't got a good examples like that but i can see other areas where we can mimic to bring about real change in this space. Sorry, Emma, anything from your research? Sorry. Um, In terms of the good practice, I think the, uh, a couple of things we've, uh, come across um, I think there's still room for improvement uh, there there are some schools for example where the data protection officer will um, seek parental consent but it seems to be a bit too much of a blanket mm. um, consent to all technology use um, so it's not really individualized enough and I understand you know why they're doing that because it is quite hard work for schools I think every time they want to do something to then have to get consent every single time for from hundreds of parents it's quite messy so I think there needs to be more support with that so I think the intention in that practice is is good and they've got the right idea but they just need a bit more support to actually um, make sure it's not a blanket consent because as we know the rate that technology develops if a child starts secondary school aged 11 and then leaves age 16 or 18 technology can come on so much in that time so a consent at the beginning of those schooling years I don't think it's really good enough for that to necessarily be valid throughout Um, but I think a a dialogue there or the intention was was quite good Um, I think maybe it could be a little bit more education perhaps for teachers knowing when to go to a data protection officer. Uh, So some people that we've spoken to, um, if there's a new um, app or whatever that the teacher wants to use in the classroom, um, they can then go to the data protection officer and get an assessment on that. So I think that's good practice, but it is dependent on the teacher knowing that they need to do that and knowing when there's a potential risk that they need to get the support. So I think there's a couple of good things in there, but there's a bit more that can be done to improve those practices. So there's there's hints, but not a lot. Jonathan, I know um, you're going to to uh, go away to teach shortly, but uh, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I was thinking about, you know, from your from your work, you know, enforcement um hasn't been you know something that we've seen much more of in in schools from the ICO but I was wondering whether the UNCR is a useful framework for achieving enforcement whether you think this code can help achieve that change or is there anything else you wanted to add yeah I'm not I was just listening to, to uh, uh Emma's point about um uh a, a blanket consent at 11 isn't I mean opportunities change in technologies but um, un, un, under the CRC and, and, and the way that it 
uh, reflects um, children is is that that's not also not going to be enough in terms of the developing child, and um, that the, a child, as they gain uh, autonomy and capacity and understanding, their views will may of on these things change and they may want to um uh opt out of something that they previously consented to or um uh opt into something that they previously withheld or their parents withheld consent for um and the crc doesn't recognize um uh specific age thresholds in that sense that a, a you can do something at 13, something at 16. It, it's, a, it's a much more fluid um, uh, uh, ability of ch children to develop and change and the balance of their rights and the balance of the rights, uh, involvement of parents uh, in children changes. So, you know, all, all, all this good, uh, good practice and and um, is absolutely right to, to identify that as good practice, but I think there's always an extra uh, layer of... Um, Aspiration. I, I hesitant to use that term because you know, th th this should be what we um, uh, should see as normal. But at the moment is very aspirational of adding those those additional layers on. Um, but in terms of you know, how a school then puts that into practice, that that's a massive uh, massive task for which there is probably an app out there to to help them uh, uh, gain these uh, uh, consent forms. Right. So. Um, uh, I mean, in terms of whether the CRC is a useful framework, yes, absolutely. But it's um, like ev everything; it's not just about uh, the CRC. The CRC does not, by itself, have legs. It's got to be given um, the um, uh, recognition in law and, and regulation, um, and the uh, age appropriate design code absolutely starts starts doing that. Um, but but as I say, it's, it's more than just saying it. Then it's it's then going through those processes of uh, and having those strong uh, enforcement mechanisms, strong ways of operation uh, operationalizing uh, it, it or to give it any kind of substantive content. Um, uh, because if we just say it and and assume that everything else that we're doing around it is best interest of the child and 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 is is important. Then. We, we we're ceasing to take it take it seriously. So, you know, it, it is up to the the, the, the ICO and their, their their use of the code to make that um, uh, um, practical and give it those legs uh, that it that it doesn't have by it by itself. I think as important to to I think you also brought out in in the report the the challenge of the code also not trying to do everything and in fact you know one of our concerns is that in this broadening out of what the ICO is taking within its remit, it actually is going to make its, its own job very much harder to enforce. Um, and perhaps we're not able to get, it sounds like, at least in the education sector and our own research and work reflects your own findings, Emma, and, and your own experiences, Mark, Mark, as well, that we're not getting some of these basic right. Um, and it's, it's hard for parents and children to exercise their rights with companies they have to go through the point of contact which is the school or the educational setting which is really particular to education and as you said Jonathan particular to children in this developing adult context that they are not fixed and fully formed and that they have a right to uh, be left alone and a sort of full and free development. Um, we, before we we'll take one more minute to, to before we wrap up, Jacob, um, you know, the last question really is, is to the ICO, you know, is there a way that you see beyond, you know, sort of whack-a-mole with individual companies, you know, that we can sort of address this sectoral wide failings, um, you know, that we really need to have a uh, systemic and cultural change, not only in training and capacity within the education sector, but also within the companies and understanding rights between parents, children and schools, the institution and individuals. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think as you sort of alluded to, Jen, it's a really systemic problem and systemic problems require almost in, inherently collaboration from different stakeholders. So I think for us as an office, we're mindful of the, the challenges you, you described, particularly around sort of uh, 
stretching the boundaries of what's considered a controller or a processor. We're also mindful and quite sensitive to the fact that schools in the UK, at least, or outside of Scotland, um, as data controllers are often sort of overwhelmed by competing demands beyond data protection and they're generally sort of time poor and stuff like that. So putting too much pressure and emphasis on them to solve everything, particularly if the given EdTech platform is a large multinational company with you know a, a lot of power and that is unlikely to change their practices off the back of one school's feedback. Um, so we're, we don't want to put too much pressure on schools. So at the moment, what we're looking to do and we have been doing already is sort of engaging with the Department for Education. Um, conversations there are sort of at an early stage, but we're thinking about, you know, for example, proposing changes to procurement practices. We're engaging with yourselves, obviously, Jen, and people like the Digital Futures Commission um, that you referenced earlier in, in the show to sort of talk about other systemic approaches that we could take you know I think one of the the DFC's proposals that was quite interesting for example was us working with Ofsted and other experts and sort of pedagogy to define what actual useful sort of edtech services are and how there can be a framework for understanding when an edtech service is helpful and necessary which will then help us as an office to understand whether the data processing is necessary in proportion and stuff like that so I guess what I would say is yeah we're sort of always open to collaboration and if there are any ideas for systemic changes or changes that can help sort of address some of the structural challenges that we discussed that we can contribute to then do get in touch. Brilliant, thank you. Well, I mean, I think that, that sums up, it brings us to a good place. I think we're we're not in a, an easy place to, to make these systemic changes. I think, you know, Defend Digital Me is a call to action. And I think that's what we'd wrap up this, this event with. Um, and, you know, championing the, the role of the ICO in enforcement and data protection, you know, making sure that those um, duties don't get lost among the expanding demands of the ICO and, and the data protection environment changes we're expecting. Um, also has to come, I think, with the recognition that data protection law isn't the solution to all rights infringements in the digital context. Um, and you know, we're braced for a review of the Human Rights Act. Um, and as Jonathan mentions in the Lit Review, you know, the effectiveness of the UNCRC is limited with, with weak international enforcement mechanisms, uneven domestic incorporation. In fact, even Scotland has had some pushback from Westminster on incorporating it into domestic Scottish law. Um, whereas, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights although not designed specifically for children, has mechanisms, you know, including a functional court to uphold rights. So I think while we're looking at these codes of practice and for guidance and setting expectations, um, you know, in or beyond the classroom, the routes for enforcement is something we're going to vigorously defend and champion to uphold the, the, the full range of human rights in the digital environment for children. And, you know, perhaps look beyond data protection law, looking to something like an Education and Digital Rights Act, where it goes beyond questions of, you know, consent and, and data protection, but actually is a, a research project consensual. Are we including children in what is done to them or should it be done with them? Um, and looking at teacher training, capacity, capability. Mark has mentioned the, the quality standards, um, the health and safety standards of products, getting some sort of kite marking system perhaps in place. Um, that would be, you know, before you would get access to the UK's education system to sell or give away your product. Um, looking at what Emma brought out, you know, trying to understand this very special context of children and parental rights and how we divide those roles and understand those responsibilities and duties as children um, change and develop, as Jonathan brought out there at the end, you know, the, the developing child is a particular um, notion and very uh, specific as well to the education sector more broadly and as Mark you mentioned we're doing all of this in the context of an ever shifting data protection environment and technology environment where more and more invasive technologies are coming in with less and less accountability and perhaps even you know less and less understanding of how they work uh, in in the teaching profession not because of um, their unwillingness to do it, but because of capacity, just having to do everything uh, all at the same time. So lots to be done. Um, delighted, um, Jacob, you, you sound so positive about the ICOs looking and its forward vision and planning for children and what might be possible. Um, I want to thank each of you enormously, uh, Mark Martin, Emma Nottingham, uh, Jacob, Anthony Redshaw for our brilliant uh, translation today, and in particular, uh, uh, Jonathan Collinson for our collaboration on the report. I hope you'll all 
uh, take a look. It's on our website and um, you can uh, request a hard copy if you'd like one. Thank you very much. Um, we'll wrap up there and we'll put the recording on our website in the future. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>